A big hello, Shiloh Church. It's great to see you for another week of church. Uh, give us a big shout out if you're on the uh, chat room live. Uh, tell us where you're watching this from. If you're podcasting this and so you're watching it later on or you're, you're checking it out on the YouTube channel, I want you to feel super duper welcome to wherever you are, whether you're on a bus, on a plane, climbing a mountain, at the gym, all that good stuff. We're gonna be looking at the Word of God. I believe the Word of God is powerful. It's a game changer. If you've got your Bible, we're going to be looking at the book of Numbers, chapter 13. We're going to be reading from verse 25. Numbers, chapter 13, verse 25. Let me give you the backdrop while you're turning to that. If you're driving, please don't turn to that. Pay attention and I'll read it to you. Um, basically, the nation of Israel was a nation of slaves. The Egyptians had enslaved them. They got them to work, building all their cool stuff. And God broke the nation of Israel out. He took them into the desert, which is somewhere that the Egyptians couldn't follow because God had put a stop to that. They're in the desert. The nation's leader, Moses, sends out 12 spies to go into um, the land that the Bible nicknamed the promised land. You might have even heard that expression if you've been around church for a little while. But he sent him into the promised land to kind of spy and bring back a report. And so the kind of the download for that episode happens right here. What it says. So they went up and they spied on the land in the wilderness from Zin to Rehob near Lebo Hamath. There's a lot of strange names here. If I get them wrong, no offense intended anyone watching from this part of the world. They went up into the Negeb and they came to Hebron. Uh, Hamin, Shenshi, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Hebron was also built seven years before Zoran in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Eshul and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. So there's this branch. It's so big. The grapes are so big, it took two strong men to carry it, right? They also brought with them some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the valley of Eshul because the, uh, the cluster of the people that had cut down uh, from there. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel in Kadesh near the wilderness of Paran, and they reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit that they had taken from the land. Pause. So if you're watching this, or you're listening to this, or you're reading along with this, and maybe you did better with the names than I did, you're probably thinking, why on earth did 12 spies go and check this place out? And like even crazier, like why would all of these people gather? I mean, I know there was no Netflix, there was no YouTube, there was no social media, but surely they had better things to do than to come back and hear a bunch of Google map directions. Why did everybody seem so engrossed in this activity of checking out the land? And if you're thinking that, that's a great question. So let me explain what's going on here. Way, way, way back, the nation of Israel was founded by a guy called Abraham. Abraham was a great man of God. If you've been around church a while, you might I heard um, people preach about him. He's an awesome guy. So get, to, get this right. God says to Abraham, what I'm going to do, I am going to give you a land. You're going to get an inheritance. You are going to have your own place for your own people. And it's going to be amazing. He, he says things like it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. Abraham's really, really excited. When his wife, Sarah, dies, she's really old. He actually buys a small piece of uh, of a, like a burial plot for his wife in that land. He's had negotiations with kings about that land. He's had important meetings about that land. And so the nation of Israel was raised on stories of Abraham and this land. And they had been told from father to son, from mother to daughter, hey, guess what? This land is coming to you. This is going to be yours one day. This is going to be yours one day. This is going to be yours one day. And so now the spies are going to go and check out that land. It would be a little bit like if I said to you, I've got some good news. You have inherited a castle in Europe. And so uh, you, maybe you book a, a night for dinner and your kids are going to go overseas. They're going to film a whole bunch of stuff. Or maybe your mum and dad are going to go overseas. They're going to film up a whole bunch of stuff about the castle. They're going to look at what legal loopholes you have to jump through to make it yours and transfer the name over and all that kind of stuff. And this dinner is the night that you're going to find out about it. You'd be crossing down K's on the calendar. You'd be excited about the possibility of what could be. And that night when they walk through the door with the photos and the videos and the answers, you'd be stoked. That's what's happening here. That's why the nation of Israel have gathered. This is their moment in the sunshine. This is what everything has been for, right? And so this wouldn't be an ordinary event. This wouldn't be an ordinary meeting. If you're taking notes, number one, type number one if you're in the chat, so I know you're paying attention. Number one, facts are facts. It's how you interpret them that matters. Facts are facts. It's how you interpret them that matters. The facts were, in this situation, 
pretty easy to see. God had promised Abraham's descendants, which was the nation of Israel that's gathered there, that they would inherit this land. That was a fact. They knew it to be true, right? This land would be flowing with milk and honey. They saw it. They concluded that, yeah, the grapes and all the rest of it, 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 it was that good. Um, uh, the, the facts had confirmed that, yes, there was giants in the land. There was different nations that were already inhabiting it. That, that was something, yep, cool, they knew that. Um, the facts were that, you know, there were vineyards and walled cities and that kind of stuff in land. All that stuff were the facts. Nothing was changed about that. And that's cool. Facts are facts, right? But it's how you interpret them that matters. It's how you look at them that matters. It's how you assess them that matters. And that's what we've got here, right? Because in a situation like this, where there's a lot of emotion stirring and there's a lot of stuff happening in the room, it's very easy to add to the facts. It's very easy to add a little bit of chocolate sauce, a little bit of sugar on top. That's exactly what would have happened here. People could have said, well, I hope this, I think this, I feel this, I sense this, but the facts are the facts, right? It's how you interpret them that matters. And so if you're listening to this, I would, I would put to you that the only major difference between a good report and a bad report is often not the facts, it's actually your perception when you're looking at those facts. Um, so for example, uh, let's, let's, let's look at perceiving situations. Let's look at the nation of Israel, right? And we'll get into our life, your life, my life, all that good stuff. So if you're looking at it this way, you could say, well, I mean, Phil, it's crazy. You got a land out there and it's full of giants and it's full of like warlike nations and there's these crazy walled cities and yeah, there's vineyards, but there are other people living in them and you know, they kind of like, they don't want to give that stuff up easy and you got to cross the desert to get there. It's on the other side of a desert and deserts are hot, dry, horrible places to travel through. And you know, we've never been established before as a nation and you could totally look at the facts that way. You could totally interpret the facts that way because the facts are the facts. But if you interpret it from that perception, that's one way to look at it, right? And in that case, you'd have a bad report. But you could look at it another way. You could look at it like this. You could say, you know, we broke out of Egypt because God divinely intervened. God had to send 10 miraculous waves of plagues and then a whole bunch of miracles on top of that. And Egypt is the most powerful nation on the earth bar none. So if God could break us out of Egypt, a few small tribes here or there, a few descendants of Anak and the Canaanites here or there, God can handle that for breakfast. Yes, there are walled cities and yes, there are uh, uh, vineyards and all those kinds of things. But that means when we get in there and we're victorious, we won't have to establish it. We've spent our whole lives building cities for somebody else, but God has set aside cities for us. We've spent our whole life pressing uh, uh, grapes in a vineyard for somebody else. Now we're going to be able to press grapes for ourselves. Isn't that a great thing? Isn't that a cool thing? Hey, we're in a desert, but that means that we're going to be hard to track and hard to follow because who wants to be in a desert? So we're going to cross the border onto the other side. We're going to go into the other side and they're not even going to see us coming because they're not watching the desert. They're not watching their flank. So still facts, haven't changed the facts, but because my perception is different, I have now given a good report rather than a bad report, right? Facts are facts. It's all how you interpret them that matters. You know, I was thinking about this actually when I was writing this message in relation to my, my dad and, and, and you see, I was younger, right? I was head over heels in love with Krista. Uh, for those of you who know her, you'll know why. She's amazing. She's clearly my better half. And um, so when I was in love with Krista, I wanted to get married to her, right? But I thought, I wonder what Krista's dad's going to say. I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask my dad, see what my dad would say if Krista was his daughter. And so that's what I said to dad. I said, hey, dad, if, 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 if you were Krista's dad and I was asking you, I want to marry your daughter, what would you say? And my dad, um, I'd sent him that in an email. So my dad wrote back in an email and he was basically like, listen, because I love you, because you're my son, let me tell you the truth. The truth is what I would say is I think you're a great guy. I'm really happy you're going out with my daughter, but I don't think you're ready to marry her yet. And my dad went and listed all of these things. He said, you know, son, um, you know, you, you can't seem to hold down a job. You switch from job to job, which is cool. You're in your early 20s. You're just trying to figure yourself out. And I'm okay with that but I'm gonna want you to be able to support my daughter. You know, son, um, you don't even have a car because you blew the money for a car on something stupid. You know, that's all good, we get that. We're all in our young 20s once, but I want a level of financial responsibility if you're gonna marry my daughter. There was this whole list of things. You know, those facts were all true. And I could have interpreted that as like, oh, well, my dad thinks I'm a loser and I guess I am a loser and I'm never gonna marry anybody good and I'm gonna marry someone that hates me and I'm probably gonna end up hating them and it's all gonna go real bad. 
Or I could look at it and say, no, my dad loves me enough to tell me the truth. And if I work on these things, not only will I get the girl of my dreams, but on top of that, my life will be better for it. So that's what I did. I worked on all of those things. Eventually, a few years later, I did get married to Krista. My life was in a better position. My marriage started in a healthier position. I was in such a great place because I chose to take what would have been a bad report as a good report. And, you know, I'm just thinking as, you, as I say this, what does your life look like right now? What are the facts that you're staring at? What are the situations that you're looking at? What are the ways that you're processing some things? Maybe you've got a bill. Maybe there's an issue with uni. Maybe there's a legal problem or is a, a PR issue or there's a COVID thing. I'm not saying that the facts aren't true. Maybe there's a challenge in your family. Maybe there's a challenge in your marriage. Maybe there's an issue with your kids. I'm not saying that the facts aren't the facts. I'm not saying that you don't have a right to feel that way. My question is this, in and amongst all the facts, in and amongst all the issues, in and amongst all the stuff, how are you gonna interpret them? How are you gonna perceive those things? And on top of that, I would add, and this was the challenge with the nation of Israel, how do you perceive God? How do you perceive the word of God? Because if you do have that, that shifts the whole thing entirely. And, and let me prove what I mean. So um, uh, perception of God, right? Uh, the Bible says in uh, Psalm 147.5, Jeremiah 23.24, that God is all powerful, God is all knowing, and that God is everywhere. So if you add on top of that, that 1 John 4 teaches us that God is love, that means that we know there is a God out there who is near you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't walked away because he's everywhere. He knows everything, which means, yeah, he knows all the challenging things about you, but he knows the good things about you. He is all powerful and he loves you. Now have that in the back of your mind as I read this scripture. Psalm 37, 23 says this, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. So yes, let's look at the facts again with Israel. Yes, there were giants, a land of fortified cities. Yes, the enemy controlled the vineyards. There's no argument that it required divine intervention, but God is all powerful, which means God could have intervened. Yes, I'm not saying that they weren't a fear, fearsome warlike people in a lot of these places, but God knows everything, which means they could not outsmart him. They couldn't outstrategize him. They couldn't outmaneuver him. God was a step ahead. On top of that, yeah, they might have felt afraid, but God is everywhere, which means God is right by their side. He wouldn't abandon them. He was with them in Egypt. He'll be with them in the desert. And as they cross into the promised land, God will be right there in the thick of it with them. And on top of that, God is love. Now you don't, if you love somebody, because it talks about like the Lord directing his steps. If you love someone, you don't direct their steps into a bad place. You don't direct them into a mess. You don't direct them into a car crash. If you love somebody, you direct them into good things. If you're planning a date for your husband or your wife, and it's a, maybe a 10th anniversary date, you plan their steps to be good steps. So God loves them. So if God's calling them to the promised land, it's going to be a good thing. It's going to sort itself out. It's going to be okay. That is a way of looking at the facts with a perception that brings a good report. That's the good news. So now think about your life. Maybe think about that thing I was saying before, if it's a bill, if it's a family issue, it's something else. How do you perceive God? How do you perceive God's word? How do you perceive it, how God looks at that situation? Line yourself up so that you're seeing things the way God is seeing them. And you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes that can be tough when it's emotional. You know, the facts are the facts. It's how you interpret them. But you want to add a little bit of sugar. You want to add a little bit of salt, a little bit of chocolate sauce on top of those facts and say, well, I'm feeling this and whatever. So for me, I personalize that scripture. I say things like, the Lord directs my steps. He delights in every detail of my life. Yes, the facts are the facts, but it's how I interpret them. And I do interpret them through the lens of God is directing my steps. Maybe even right now, you need to even write it on a mirror or a business card or whatever and stare at it and tell yourself, you know what? Yes, the Lord directs miracle steps. The Lord directs Emily's steps. The Lord directs Patricia's steps or, or, or whatever. So let's take a look at how the Israelites did with this kind of little challenge. Verse 27, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land he sent us to explore, and it is indeed bountiful, a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, here is this, uh, the kind of fruit it produces, but the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, 
The Amalekites live in Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, the Canaanites live on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Number two, if you're taking notes, number two, type number two in the chat. Faith is often tested in small things. Faith is often tested in small things. See, it's very interesting because if you read scripture, if you study history, if you're a history buff, if you love the History Channel like I do, you'll know that this is actually one of the most monumentous occasions in the nation's history. One of the most incredible occasions in the nation's history was actually in this meeting because this was the meeting that their faith got tested. Just let that sink in for a moment. The moment that their faith was tested was not on the battlefield. It wasn't when they were attacking giants. It wasn't when they were charging against world cities. It was in this meeting that their faith got tested. So spoiler alert, right? For those who haven't read the next few chapters of the, of the book of Numbers, just fascinating stuff. What basically happens is God says, okay, 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 okay. This generation clearly isn't ready to take the promised land. You're freaking out about it. You're spiraling out of control. You really don't want to do this. That's cool. I don't want to force you to do something you don't want. So I tell you what, you're going to read this like a bad report. Cool, no problems. I will wait till you've all died out. I will raise up your children and your children are going to be the people that inherit the promised land. So one of the most major moments in the nation's history wasn't on the battlefield. It was actually in the boardroom. And, and, and that's the thing. We, 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 we forget that, that faith is often tested in the small things, not just the big things. See, they were a nation of slaves. They grew up as a nation of slaves. They were told again and again, they're not good enough. They don't have what it takes. They're never going to get there, all that kind of stuff, right? And so it had sort of gotten cemented into their thinking. Even though God had broken them out of Egypt, even though God had liberated them from Egypt, even though they were no longer slaves in Egypt, even though they had pressed out in Egypt, they were out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. Egypt was still in their thinking. That slave mentality was still there and they had talked themselves into defeat. So the moment that their faith was tested, they were already shot. You know, that can happen so often because more often than not, it's actually our mindset that limits us more than our skill set. And um, I was thinking about this because I was watching a doco and anyone who now knows me really well in this church has already figured out I love a good doco. I was watching a documentary about the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan. Uh, don't at me, LeBron James fans. I'm not interested. Jordan is still better. LeBron needs to win a few more rings before I hear your trash talk. Um, uh, just a little bit of sidebar there for all the non-basketball people. Anyway, so Michael Jordan played uh, in the US in the city of Chicago for a team called Chicago Bulls in the 90s. And they were, they were unbelievable. Um, chuck your favorite Bulls emoji or gif in the chat. Um, so they would often turn up to play teams. And, and sometimes I was watching this doco, they'd play on a bad night. Maybe there were some injuries, maybe people were a bit tired, and they were actually vulnerable to have been defeated. But the other team was so intimidated to play the Bulls. The other team was so intimidated to come up against Michael Jordan, they had already told themselves, are we going to lose? Let's just make it respectable. Let's not get dunked on too many times. And so they would turn up and even though the Bulls were vulnerable, they would win anyway because the other team had already talked themselves into a loss. And as crazy as it sounds, that's actually what's happening in this chapter right now. The enemy was vulnerable. The nations were vulnerable. They could have taken them, but the Israelites had already talked themselves into a defeat. So God said, fine, 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 fine. Don't worry about it. I'll wait till the next generation comes. And, um, and I go back to what I was saying before about your mindset holds you back further than your skill set ever will. There's this verse in Proverbs 23 verse 7. I love it how it puts it. The writer puts it like this. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you think defeated, that's what you're going to get. If you think victorious, that's what you're going to get. So we've got to change what we're thinking about the situation. We've got to change what we're thinking about the cities and about the giants and about the land and all of that stuff. Because yes, you can leave Egypt, but Egypt needs to leave you. Yes, you can come out of slavery, but slavery's got to come out of you. You've got to change the mindset. You've got to change the way you think about your family, about that bill, about that situation. You've got to have a victorious mindset. 
because our future's on the line and often we don't even realize it. We say, yeah, but it doesn't look that big right now. But as I said, faith is often tested in the small things. The battlefield was not where the Israelites' faith was tested. It was this boardroom. It was this conversation. Maybe your faith is being tested as you open the mail. Maybe your faith is being tested as you drive to uni. Maybe your faith is being tested as you scroll through Facebook. I don't know. It's all kinds of different things for different people. But here's what I do know. Faith is often tested in the small things, in the little things where our mindsets are kind of caught up in. And you know, the questions I like to ask myself pretty regularly are, um, who am I hanging out with? What kind of conversations am I having? And what kind of thoughts am I thinking? Because those are the real indicators of what kind of mindset I've actually got. Who am I hanging out with? What kind of conversations am I having? And what kind of thoughts am I thinking? The answer to those three questions usually tells me where I'm gonna be in 12 months time. Now, I don't know, where do you wanna be in 12 months time? Where do you wanna be in two years time? I'll tell you where I wanna be. I wanna be taking cities for this church. That's what I wanna be. I don't want to be conquering giants. That's where I want to be. I want to be settling God's people into new lands. That's where I want to be. I want to be walking in the fruit of the blessing of the harvest of God. I believe what the Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And we see that in this scripture. I want that to be true for our church. I want our church to have some of the greatest days ahead of it. That's what I want to see in 12 months time. And so if I want to see that, I've got to change how I think. And yeah, there'll be small things. There'll be little things that happen in our church, but that's where our faith gets tested. There'll be small things in your marriage. There'll be little things with your kids. That's where your faith gets tested in your finances and in all those other areas. So we've got to watch. We've got to watch. We've got to watch. Verse 30. So Caleb's speaking, right? He says, let's go at once to take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. Pause. This is where I just love the Bible. And, you know, sometimes people will at me and they'll say, hey, Phil, uh, you know, the Bible, like, I don't know why, like, it's a bit random. Hey, it's not a great book. I don't know why you're so psyched about it. You know, there's all these overlap parts of the Bible. It's kind of like it tells the same story again and again. It's like that uncle that won't stop repeating himself. Like, I don't get it, Phil. Like, why are you so, why are you so in love with this book? I'm telling you, the Bible is the most incredible book in the universe. Um, there are so many signs that, um, that it wasn't written by man, but it was written through man from God. But this is actually one of them. See, the Bible doesn't just repeat itself. The Bible looks at the same situation from different perspectives. Like when you watch sport and there's a replay and they show it from a different camera angle, the Bible actually does this and it actually even does it in this story. So in the book of Numbers, we're looking at this from the Israelites' perspective. We're looking at this meeting from the Israelites' perspective. Do you wanna see what the other camera angle looks like? I will show you what the other nations were thinking at this time, because the Bible actually records that. Eventually, as I said, spoiler alert, the children's generation actually does go into the promised land and Joshua basically interviews one of the guys who is um, the ruler or one of the rulers of a foreign nation that they were afraid of, a foreign nation that everyone's like, we can't beat them, they're giants, they're crazy, rah, 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 rah. So in the book of Joshua 9, 24 to 25, this is what it says, Joshua 9, 24, 25. We got the message loud and clear that God, your God, commanded through his servant Moses to give you the whole country and destroy everyone living in it. We were terrified because of you. That's why we did this. That's it. We're at your mercy. Whatever you decide is right for us, do it. (laughs) So that means that Joshua and Caleb are right all along. The majority was wrong all along. Joshua and Caleb are right all along. So if you're taking notes, number three, type number three in the chat. If you're on the podcast, maybe give us three fingers. No one will see what you're doing other than uh, you, which means people will think you're crazy, but hey, life's fun, all right? Number three, they're not the giants, you are. They're not the giants, you are. You're not the one outgunned in this situation. You're not the one outnumbered in this situation. You're not the one that's gonna be defeated in this situation. The enemy is. The enemy's outgunned. The enemy is outnumbered and the enemy will be defeated in Jesus' name. They're not the giants. You are. The enemy should be quaking in his boots when you get up out of bed. The enemy should be like, oh my gosh, sister so-and-so has got out of bed right now. We got problems. Oh my gosh, that bloke's picking up the phone to make a phone call. We got problems. The enemy should be worried about you, not the other way around. 
Don't be stressed about what the devil is doing. Don't be freaking out about the enemy. The enemy is not the giant you are. You've got what it takes. The enemy is afraid of you. It's like, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a circus or one of those fun houses where there's that mirror room, you know, where there's all those strange mirrors that do stuff, mirrors that make you look really skinny. Love those. That's always good. Self-esteem boost. Give us a double hand emoji. Um, mirrors that make you look a little bit wider. That's not great. Don't love that. But you know those mirrors that make you look tall and short, right? It's kind of like this. What fear does is fear shrinks you and it makes your problem seem taller. Fear shrinks you and it makes your problem seem taller. And I just get this sense that there's people out there and you've been staring in that mirror that shrinks you for so long, you've forgotten that you're actually the giant. The enemy isn't the big deal, you are. The enemy isn't the one that's gonna be uh, you know, victorious, you're the one that's gonna be victorious, hallelujah. And fear and faith are like mirrors. We just gotta make sure we stare into the right one. Because otherwise we can forget our height. We can forget who we are in Christ. We can lose sight of all of that. And I don't think that that's what God wants, right? Uh, you know, I've been um, preaching recently and you can um, smash out the previous podcasts or watch the previous YouTube clips to check it out. I've been preaching about rain and about First Kings and about the rain that's coming. And I believe it's part of that. God's been calling people in our congregation, in this campus to, um, to be dreaming again. And he's been challenging people. You should try this. You should do this. And some of you have talked yourselves out. Because you're like, man, I'm not the giant. I don't have what it takes. And I don't really know, Phil. It's all a little bit. Hey, I'm here to tell you, you do have what it takes. You are more than a conqueror. You are the giant, not the enemy. And, and that's not just because of who you are. That's because Jesus alive in you is something pretty epic. That's because the power of God is alive in you. That's because when you're speaking tongues, you're speaking a heavenly language. That's because you're filled with the gifts of the Spirit. That's because the steps of the Lord have been ordered before you and you're walking in those steps. That's because you, you carry the authority of Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's because his, his blood is at your disposal as you accomplish His will on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. With Jesus, you have what it takes. With Jesus, you will overcome the enemy. With Jesus, you will walk into new territories. With Jesus, you will take new vineyards. With Jesus, I'm here to tell you, they're not the giants, you are. Now, I don't know where you find yourself this morning or this evening or this afternoon or whenever you're watching this or you're podcasting it or whatever. I don't know. Maybe you're here and you're like, well, feel like I'm just staring at a bunch of crazy facts right now. I get it. I get it. The facts are the facts, but it's how you interpret them that matters. you got to have a perception. you got to look at it from the perception that God is bigger. God is stronger. God is mightier. He hasn't abandoned you. He loves you. He's on your side. He's ordering your steps. Or maybe, you know, you're like, well... <laughs> It, you know, it's just, I just feel like I'm going through these little things right now. Hey, pay attention to those little things because your faith is being tested in that. Your future is being tested in that. I can tell where you are in 12 months time by those little moments, by those little battles. It's often more about our brain than the battlefield, right? Or, or maybe you're like, that's all good. I got that. But I'm just looking in the mirror and it says I'm like two feet tall. And I'm here to tell you the enemy isn't the giant you are. You got to go after it right now. Hey, um, and maybe you're watching this and, and you're like, oh man, this, this sounds all good. Where do I start? Hey, I tell you the best place to start, you need to start with Jesus. Jesus Christ needs to be Lord and Savior of your life. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm not asking if you watch our live stream. I'm not asking how many podcasts you listen to today. I'm asking if Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life. Lord means he's in charge. He calls the shots, right? And you do what he says. Uh, I'm not saying that that means that you'll always get it right. You know, um, we all make mistakes and that's why we need Jesus, not just as our Lord, but as a Savior. Savior means he forgives you for everything you've ever done. The Bible calls those mistakes sin, but you can call them whatever word you want. You just know that we make mistakes. We all muck it up from time to time and we need Jesus. And so if you need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, either for the first time or if you're really honest, you've made this decision before, but um, you know, you kind of often done your own thing and you know, you're kind of sitting back on the throne again and you need Jesus back as Lord. I just want to pray for you right now. Let's say, repeat after me prayer. Uh, you know, you can repeat after me whether you're jogging, you can repeat after me if you're on a plane, you can repeat after me if you're at home. I don't even need to be there because it's not about me and you, it's about you and Jesus. So I just want you to repeat after me if that's it and your heart's beating hard in your chest. Dear Jesus, please come into my life as Lord and Savior. Help me to follow you all my days in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Thank you so much for tuning in today. So awesome having you with us. If you're ever in the area, stop by. We'd love to have you at one of our services. You can jump on our website and get all the details for those. I'd love to meet you one day. But hey, if you made that decision for Jesus for the first time, regardless of where you are in the world, inbox us, flick us an email, reply to the comment section. Just let us know because it's seriously the best news ever. We want to be able to congratulate you. Thanks so much for tuning in, Shiloh. God bless you. Bye-bye.